Hopefully everyone can see that. I'm going to take that as a yes. It's the um, It's been one of the lines of the last year or so of doing online presentation, online teaching, assuming the tech is working. Anyway, um, thank you, Richard, for that introduction. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of um, a collective of environmental archaeologists. I don't know what the collective noun is for a group of environmental archaeologists. If anyone has any suggestions, please put it in the chat. Um, so it's myself. I'm presenting on behalf of uh, Dr. Kevin Carney. We can hear at um, UCC, uh, Wendy Carruthers, uh, David Smith, University of Birmingham, and Matt Law, Bath Spa. Um, I'll be honest, this is going to be kind of a broad overview of um, the results of our work to date. It is by no means exhaustive and it's by no means final. And in many ways, um, I think where we are, and this probably comes through with um, with Martin's excellent talk previously, which I hope is kind of given a really good introduction to the landscape we're investigating. In many ways, I think we've come up with probably more questions than answers, um, which I think is a good thing. Um, but certainly some of the key questions um, I'll return to in this, I, I think are relevant in terms of how we understand Doggerland as a landscape on different scales. Um, so that's something that hopefully I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch on. So the, the cores I'm gonna talk about um, are only four of the cores. And as I say, the, the, these analyses are by no means complete. Um, so we've got core 34, that's been mentioned already. We have uh, core 51, which is down here. And we have core seven and 20, which is over here. So again, Martin gave you a reasonable idea of the scale of the landscape. I think it's very easy when you're working in submerged landscapes to kind of lose the idea of scale that we're so used to when we're working on terrestrial areas. And I really like Martin's image of the, the Thames Valley. That gives you an idea of the kind of issues, I suppose, around scale and interpretation. Anyway, so I'm going to begin with L34. Um, this is, sorry about this, this is the saddle core that Martin mentioned earlier. It's a small wetland, freshwater wetland perched on what Martin refers to the saddle. And every time he says, says saddle, that's what I think. Apologies. Um, I'm really going to look at the bottom part of, of this core. So really a 50, 50 centimetre um, section at the bottom. So it's a series of organic clays and silts into a peat. Um, Tom Hill is going to return to say a bit more about the silts and clays in particular that's really important in terms of the formation of this small freshwater wetland so just bear that one in mind for the subsequent um, presentation and um, i should also at this stage um, lodge the following uh, trigger warning I'm, I'm really sorry there are going to be pollen diagrams in this talk i can only apologize for that um, again i think there's a few paleoecologists in the group i looked through earlier i think i saw michael grant now i'm sure there's some others um, this is a bit, a bit of a busman's holiday. Um, I'd, I'd hope to come up with some a, a kind of more user-friendly way of talking about the uh, pollen data, but we've not had a chance to do that, so I'm sorry. Um, I'll try and make it as painless um, as I possibly can. Okay, so here we go, a lovely pollen diagram. Um, this is um, this is L34. So again, you can see this at the bottom. Um, actually, I'm just going to pull up uh, a pen. Here, just just to help us out a bit here. So you, most of the diagrams have the chronology plotted down this side here. Um, again, these are provisional chronologies, most of them. In this case, we have the results of some of uh, Dr. Derek Hamilton's Bayesian modeling of that sequence. And straight away, I'm sure you can see um, that this is basically, we're going back into the, uh, the interstadial here, into Windermere. And we do have more of the record above here for various reasons, but I'm not going to talk about that. We're still working on aspects of it. But the really is just to kind of give you a run through of, of, I suppose, the general pattern of what we know about vegetation history of Doggerland from this data. So, so again, what we can see here is really the pattern of vegetation change is very, very typical of the interstadial. Uh, we, we have an open landscape at the bottom here. And again, you can just read across the chronology here or here. An open landscape dominated by grasses, and sedges, um, very few trees or shrubs. Uh, willow is certainly present, usually underrepresented. And juniper, you can see the juniper uh, peak here. That's very typical of this part of the um, of the interstadial. So the expansion of uh, juniper uh, scrub and then a subsequent decline. You can also see there's some other trees and shrubs in here, not least betula. Um, it should also draw your attention to the fact that these are these are selected taxonomy pollen diagrams. Um, what is notable for almost all of these records is the 
generally very, very low presence of herbs in the most part, um, not a huge diversity and generally very low values. Kind of often the same for aquatics, but you can see here we do have aquatic plants down here at the bottom, such as uh, Myriophyllum, that's water milfoil and things like uh, reed mace and pondweed as well. So here's our record going through and we can bring in some of Wendy's macrofossil data at this point that kind of fills out the picture. So as we're moving into the um, into stadium, as the peat starts to form, we definitely have a, uh, a wetland that's a birch willow fen car. We have evidence in the macrofossil record for both tree and shrub birch at that point. And again, another kind of range of um, wetlands, uh, aquatic plants and taxa that, that won't be surprising, I suppose, in this kind of freshwater context. So we've got uh, many anthes, we have uh, lymphaea, sedges, lemon dots, duckweed. Um, we also have, and I think, I apologise to David, who I think is listening in, I think I only have one, one reference to his beetle date. He's still working on that, and hopefully that this will start to fill out the picture. Uh, and he, <coughs> excuse me, he reports he has a single elytrum, that's a wing case, of Tanisphorus lemni, which is associated with, you can probably guess, with, um, with the duckweed there. And that's actually from slightly further up the sequence. So this is our earliest part of the record. Again, you can think of this um, in terms of, I suppose, if you think in terms of human activity across Doggerland, I guess in a terrestrial context, this might be the sort of location that in a very environmentally deterministic way, um, upper Paleolithic or Mesolithic hunter gatherers may be drawn towards. And again, that's something we can talk about. I'm certainly not saying that is definitely the case. But again, I suppose in terms of predictive thinking and modelling, that's that's important. OK, so moving on. Sorry, another pollen diagram. So it's moving on slightly in time. So again, we're here, we have our chronology. So we're moving into, into the start of the Holocene. And again, you can see that quite clearly here. We have um, the expansion of, of birch, then we have pine. And then slightly later on, as we get into the Holocene proper, you know, your typical range of deciduous trees, such as oak, Elm, quite high values for elm actually comparatively to Doggerland. I wonder whether that's something to do with the calcareous deposits, perhaps that Martin referred to earlier, and a very pronounced uh, Coriolis rise there. And again, these chronologies are provisional, but that's happening about eleven thousand two hundred cal BP. So we're going from again a very open landscape. Um, possible evidence for reworking in here. That's fern spores, often an indicator of, of reworked sediment. I should say, however, the pollen preservation is generally pretty good. Also, willow is again very uh, very significant for most of this part of the record, very underrepresented panologically, so certainly present on the wetland soils locally. And macrofossils, uh, preservation is poor. Again, the macrofossil preservation seems to vary quite significantly between the cores um, for a variety of reasons. I think, I think we, we need to discuss and pick apart, and certainly we'll see with the beetle data in particular on that front, uh, the work we did on the Humber REC, David Smith's data, I seem to recall he had quite small faunas, but some quite interesting ones. You might want to talk to that afterwards. And some of those are quite interesting in terms of evidence for woodland and trees, if, I, if I'm right there, David. Um, again, poorly preserved. There are various other wetland taxa uh, in the uh, macrofossil record. Again, stuff that is, I suppose, unsurprising. Uh, Potter McEaton, Pondweed again, Typha, Reed Mace, Rushes, Myriophyllum, that's water milfoil. So again, all these uh, plants that are typical of, of, of largely freshwater environments. And what's interesting is, is really how rarely we see this in, in turning up in some of the pollen records. We often have this discrepancy between the pollen and the macrofossil um, records as well. Okay, how are we doing there? Good. Okay, so moving on a bit to um, ELF 20. And I'm just looking at this section of ELF 20. So this is the bottom moving uh, upwards. So we're going from kind of the teal, the sterile till deposits into kind of sandy, organic silts, and eventually into this peat unit here. So again, it's a relatively, a relatively short sequence. And again, this is what it looks like. Again, there's our uh, calibrated uh, ranges. So you can see we're going back into the end of the, um, into the Loch Lomond, into the stadial, and then into the Holocene above. And again, that's very clearly reflected in the stratigraphic changes you see where we go essentially from organic sands into kind of more organic peats and silts and so forth. Um, and so we get this really kind of black peat here. Um, Again, the pollen doesn't hold a huge number of surprises. We see in importance of birch coming in here, Scots pine, and again, as we see later, oak um, and less elm here. Um, and again, really important 
willow that shows very much a local presence nearly kind of 50 percent of our total land pollen so um what we also see is a kind of evidence for open ground i'm going to come back to this in a minute um, i think we're quite unclear in terms of what we can and can't say about the structure of the vegetation of dogland that's the terrestrial landscape if you like and again as i said earlier if we look at the aquatic records we have some of these species turning up um, the reason there's very few herbs plotted is again this is selected tax and Kevin just pulled out the ones that are better reflected so um, we have things like Apiaceae that's the carrot family it's tall herbs uh, the Chena Podiaceae that includes um, that's the fat hen family and that includes plants that are um, saline or, or typical of salt marshes so we do get curve coming in here and that is significant because as we'll see uh, with Tom's talk um, this is an important core in terms of understanding this transition from fresh to brackish and into saline, and Tom's going to talk more to that later. But again, what is interesting, the preservation of macros is poor again. There's this betula uh, remains in there, showing a plectus, that's a soft reed rush, which I think is largely freshwater, but can be a, uh, can be a bit marine. We also have in here some more kind of marine to brackish taxa. We have Nias marina and Rupi maritima. Um, that's holly leaf naiad, that's nias. Uh, Rupi maritima is the wonderfully named widgeon grass or widgeon weed, I think it's sometimes called uh, ditch, ditch weed. Um, and that's that one's typical of brackish uh, environments. But generally, we don't see a huge evidence of perhaps what you may or may not expect at the transition from, I suppose, freshwater to brackish and saline environments. And that's important in terms of what Martin talked about, some of the other points that came up earlier particularly in terms of how we understand process and pattern of change. And again, other things we might note here, uh, these quite high values for teropsida, that's fern scores. Um, there is certainly some reworking, but again, the preservation is, is fairly decent. Um, uh, what else might we say here? Again, there's other ferns in here. There's polypodium, common polypodium, it's a little fern, uh, probably epiphytic on uh, oak trees. So I suppose we can start to get a broad impression of the general I suppose, pre-submergent vegetation of Doggerland, and it seems to be broadly a deciduous woodland. Corollus, uh, hazel, um, if you ever count causal samples from uh, Doggerland, from submerged landscape, you will see a lot of hazel. I think Kevin is probably sick this stage of counting um, samples of hazel. I'm going to say a bit more about that in a minute. I think there's a certain amount of taphonomic control going on with that representation. How am I doing for time? Okay, not so bad. So, I promise this, I, I think this is the last column diagram. Uh, just bear with me. Um, so, yeah, ELF7, and again, very similar sequence. We have these basal peats. And again, the basal peats, there is some variation in the date ranges. This is something I think we need to work on more. Um, I think Derek might say a bit more about this later on, but the, the age range for these, uh, these freshwater peats, uh, you know, pre kind of rising water table and channel aggradation in a lot of these contexts. And again, what we see here, there's our chronology. So, so again, a bit later into the Holocene, very typical as we've seen already. Higher birch, sorry, higher oak, I beg your pardon. Again, elm is quite high. We have pine in there. What you might also notice, and probably I imagine the paleoecologists and stratigraphers amongst you are noticing this, is our pollen zonations, which are here, often track or are identical with stratigraphic changes in these units so you can see that this is i think taphonomic so again we're seeing shifts as the depositional regime changes in terms of the representation and reflection of different woodland taxa in particular okay and this is interesting this is notable so we have less willow in here again this is our grass curve you might ask well what does this show us about the uh, degree of openness of the landscape um, that's a moot point I think certainly some of this curve is coming from wetland grasses. We can't separate out uh, wetland grasses such as Phragmites, common reed from dryland grasses. So some of this is certainly in channel. Some of it is probably almost coming from certainly coming from the wider landscape. But again, what do we see in the herbs? These are selected taxa, uh, very little sedges in here. This is Plantago lanceolata, which is much beloved of paleoecologists because it's what we call an anthropogenic indicator, as in it's a plant that grows in open conditions and is typically associated with the opening of woodland, mainly in the Neolithic, at least in, in most of Northwest Europe, earlier and elsewhere. 
but very, very low values. These are trace values. Sorry, when you see a cross, that's a trace value. So we are getting traces. What does that show? Does that show human activity? No, I don't think it does. I actually don't think we have any compelling evidence for direct human impact in the paleontological data, at least. You might also ask about charcoal records. Uh, generally, very low values of charcoal turning up throughout these cores, even at the base, where quite often you can see increased levels of charcoal in some of these basal peats from the Southern North Sea. And again, aquatics, you can see there, there are some, not huge numbers. Uh, Macrofossils, if we look at the basal woody peat, so I'm about 9,000, 9,400 BP, it's dominated by um, birch remains again. So this is a woody peat with birch certainly growing locally. And I think we can infer oak is in there as well, summer as well. And our general range of aquatics, typha, lemna, and carex. Um, incidentally, that's lemna, that's duckweed. Um, I was just doing a bit of research before the talk. Uh, apparently duckweed, this is absolutely nothing to do with, with dogland, ladies and gentlemen, I think. Apparently duckweed is going to be the next um, miracle crop, apparently. I've just learned that, so I'll pass that information on to you. Um, so, yeah, we do have duckweed. Wendy was talking the other day, Wendy Crothers, about possible um, climatic um, significance of lemna, and that's something we need to look into in terms of perhaps the earlier part of the record where we have the presence of um, duckweed. Anyway, so to kind of pull a little bit of this together, what, what can we say? I think in terms of a, of a broad picture, we're starting to certainly uh, fill that out. So we can say certainly that the, if you like, the early dryland vegetation of dogland um, is dominated by trees as they expand at the end of the, at the, end of the last uh, stadial. So we have pine in there, we've seen already. We have oak, we have, um, we have hazel. Uh, again, we see hazel in, in very high uh, percentages in the record. Um, I suspect this doesn't really reflect its, its actual dominance in the vegetation. I think we have an over-representation of hazel in there. Um, and again, I'm going to come back to hazel in a minute because I think the representation of tree pollen in some of these deposits, particularly as we shift from peat to silt prior to the end of the complete inundation of Doggerland, we do not see that inundation in the pollen. And I think that is also taphonomic. So uh, to come back to an earlier point and a question that was asked um, at the end of Martin's talk, what is the structure of this woodland? I, I must admit I'm, I'm unclear on that and I think as a group we're slightly unclear. Um, there are perhaps other ways into thinking about that, that's not something we've really done yet. From the pollen record you say that we would say the woodland is probably quite closed in the area where at least it's dry enough for some of these uh, deciduous trees to grow. We obviously have some substantial open wetland areas as we've seen not just the rivers but other locations such as uh, l34 where we have um, we have the saddle uh, wetland freshwater fen car certainly at least in the earlier period this is plantago lanceolata i mentioned earlier and uh, as we've seen as i've said we have very very few records of it generally single grains and i think I can say that with some confidence even for the cores that i've not shown you we, we hardly ever see that one turning up at all um, burning, I've mentioned, again, burning charcoal in, in, in deposits associated with the, with the Mesolithic in particular, uh, often reflecting uh, human activity. I'm sure this is something uh, Professor Milner might talk to tomorrow in terms of Star Car, where the burning of reed beds is, is almost certainly happening. Um, again, in, in, in these cores that we've looked at, um, I think it's fair to say with very low levels of charcoal. What does that show? Well, most of these areas are wetland, quite wet wetland as we've seen. So really the possibility of burning um, is I think very low, whether that's natural or anthropogenic. Um, again, that contrasts quite interesting with other cores from the Southern North Sea. Certainly some of the cores we have from the Humber Wreck Project and the offshore cores contained um, high quantities of charcoal. And there are other cores from this area. Again, some colleagues in the audience might wanna say something about this in the chat or afterwards. Um, but certainly we don't have very high levels of charcoal at all in these, um, in these cores. In terms of the wetland part of the landscape, as we've seen already on the wetter soils, so L34 and a few of these other uh, wetland deposits, and certainly the channels 
as they start to activate and as the peaks shift from uh, semi-terrestrial, if you like, to uh, open water, deposition of silts, clays and organic material. As we've seen already, we shift really from dominance of tax such as willow and birch through to, um, to reed. And again, at sometimes some of these uh, slightly more brackish salt tolerant taxa but again that's not something we see enormously clearly in the in the pollen record and again there's a, a number of reasons for that so what else can we say i mean underlying all of this i mean this is great to talk about uh, ecology and vegetation history and records and that, that is really important at the end of the day you know, you know what we want to try and do is get at what some of this data means for human activity, where human activity might be happening, the nature of that human activity, so forth. Um, there are a number of reasons why this is, is technically difficult, um, particularly in terms of moving, if you like, from a core or a series of cores to, if you want to think of it in terms of the reconstruction of a transgressive surface. I think this is something we'll hear a bit more about later on in terms of the modelling of that. Um, and also this brings in obviously other data sets such as Tom's um, Tom's uh, sea level data that he's going to talk a bit about and obviously Martin's data so we need to kind of bring this all together but we also have these interpretive problems sediment compression is likely to be significant I mean these peaks in particular are squashed to um, squashed to hell would be the polite word you know really squashed down so we've got great levels of compression what that means for chronology is another matter that's something We've kind of been talking about with them, um, with with Tim and Derek um, of that work as well. So ways maybe around thinking about compression and allowing for that. Um, in terms of inferences of, about vegetation change, relative sea level change, and spatial and chronological patterns of inundation, I, I, yeah, that, that is a problem we need to unpick. And obviously, underlying all this is is uh, what a couple of years ago I co coined the phrase. I'm sure other people have used this. You know, disaster or no big deal scenarios that concern the flooding or the end of Doggerland. Um, so this rapidity of, of change and, and you know how punctuated these episodes are. This data comes into this somewhere, but quite how we integrate that, not just in a methodological sense, but in a more theoretical sense as well, is another problem that continues to plague us. And hopefully that's something uh, we kind of moved can move to address in one way or another. So, yeah, underlying this, again, is this is a particular issue, as I've said already, as these sequences and as this river valley shifts from, if you like, being, uh, I suppose, the initial aggradation um, of the peats through to the channel aggradation as the channel activates as sea level rises. And this is, a, this is an estuary not too far from, from here in lovely sunny Cork. Um, and you can see the issue here. So, so as, you know, you know, here's the dry land, here are channel deposits. This is obviously a tidal estuary. So we have all these sorts of issues in terms of how we interpret the, the pollen record. And particularly what we see in many of the pollen records from this project and also from the REC is very high levels of uh, deciduous tree pollen, in particular um, hazel, right up until you pretty much get inundation. Why is that? Does that mean that hazel is growing on mud flats? No, it doesn't. Where is the dry land? Can we think in terms of obviously we don't have deep incised valleys like this, where we might have, uh, as in southwest uh, England, we might have trees growing in close proximity to tidal inlets. I don't think we have that. I think we have a taphonomic issue with very high representation of tree and shrub pollen up these river systems further towards the dry land. Okay, how am I doing? Richard has appeared. So that can only mean my time is nearly up. So I'm going to leave you with this summary. So, so really, we have a, a, an excellent data set here. And we're starting to address some of these questions. Uh, we need to do a lot more integration of the data sets. We certainly have um, my favourite word, uh, taphonomic issues in here. In particular, what we call the RSAP, the relative, relative source area of pollen for these uh, deposits that are tidal or intertidal are very large, resolving vegetation on a large scale. Mac fossil and beetle work is ongoing. That's starting to help us understand some of these differences between local, extra local and regional representation. And hopefully that's going to move us towards reconstructing patterns of flooding, 
changes in dryland vegetation across what we might call the transgressive surface. So please uh, watch this space. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, so we've got a few minutes left for questions here. Um, we've had some uh, comment first uh, about uh, the Netherlands and the Yangtze Harbour and uh, that there's evidence of repeated burning in full marshy environments. And that kind of follows on with a question um, about the charcoal and whether you can determine the species of charcoal and if this has been done. Speak I, that with Wendy, as far as I can gather from my discussions with Wendy, I think the charcoal fragments are very small. So I don't think they're identifiable. That's a very good point there and certainly one uh, one we can look into. But generally the levels of charcoal are pretty, you know, pretty small. Yeah, uh, that certainly seems to come up from you from, from what you've presented there. Um, there's a question here. Um, Sasha Kruer has, has asked about um, explain the very high percentage of uh, Sarx, 45% in ELF-20, given that it is insect pollinated. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I mean, this shows an extremely localised presence of, of willow. You know, again, the paleoecologists in the audience will, will recognise 20% is, is of total lamp on is very high, and that shows a very local presence of willow. So again, you know, we, we have this kind of, again, it's a taphonomic control. Willow is growing on the... On these wetlands in these wetland deposits, I think the DNA people might say something about that as well. Um, again, so so yeah, that that shows it shows very much that local presence. It's a good point. Um, great, thanks. Uh, so, a question from Patricia Shaw: uh, What do you think the cause is um, the discrepancy between pollen and macro signatures? <laughs> um, uh, that's that's several lectures all on its own. I guess this is an often issue for multi proxy. Uh, investigations. Um, there, are, there are a variety of, of reasons for that, um, including possibly redeposition, reworking, pollen productivity, um, again the difference between uh, where vegetation is growing in the landscape. And I suppose the point to be made there is this is always the joy of multi-proxy and I think there's always sometimes an assumption that we carry out more analyses and everything will converge and it's often the way that we carry out more analyses and some things converge and some things go in different directions. So uh, it was probably easier back in the day when you just did pollen and it was fine, you know. Um. <laughs> yeah, um, there, so there is a question here, Lauren Brown has, has put towards uh, uh, the thoughts on hazel and willow uh, coppice, copsing um, or conservation as a practice, I presume. Uh, sorry, I, as in the, the sense of, um, in, in the kind of mesolithic, I suppose, is that, is that the sense there, sorry? Yeah, well, I, I, think we probably, so, yeah. I think we're probably too early to see that. I mean, certainly high levels of hazel are very typical you know, of the early Holocene. There's a lot of discussion about the rapidity of the apparent rapidity of the hazel, the hazel rise at the start of the Holocene. And um, uh, this is something that's been quite a lot written on uh, Talent Tower's work in particular, suggesting that willow is probably growing locally right to start, you know, before the Holocene, but it's not producing much pollen. And then you get this very steep increase as the climate improves drastically and that's increases the pollination. So I think this is, that's that's probably what we're seeing there. But again, we need to look into a bit more as well. I think, you know, time for one last question um, from Stine Hildebrandt. Um, if there has ever been any study of the recent pollen in the uppermost sediment layers of different river valleys for comparison? Yeah, that's, that's a really, really good question. Um, the answer to that is, yeah, yes, there has been. And, and we certainly know that in some of these, these estuarine systems that, yeah, you're recruiting pollen from, from, all over, from all over the place. You know, the bigger the bigger these systems, the bigger your pollen source area. So, so yeah, I think that, that is certainly something that is, is at work as we shift into these, these, uh, these, these estuarine or mudflat deposits. Um, yeah, we're just seeing, we're seeing a certain amount of... of, of reflection of that the size of that source area so, so it's very frustrating you know because we see these you can kind of sometimes with the cores you can kind of go well there's the end of dogland you know there's the it's conformable we shift from the sands to the marine gravels and then your pollen records just saying yeah there's definitely hazel right up until you know case and there's obviously not the hazel is growing somewhere else i think so that is a problem great well th thank you ben we're just about on time there and so um we'll leave your presentation and